So we would like to ask you um, first, how did this all happen? Of course, you have this connection with your family and Flannery O'Connor, but it's it's very fascinating to hear about how you entered into this whole business of, of being a screenwriter and a producer of movies, but why this is your first one, and uh, how this all came about. Um, that this movie, because, you know, today we, we, we have a category of independent films, but this is obviously something that is uh, the whole the way that this is made, the, 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 the story itself is not that conventional at all, but as fascinating as so, so, so tell us how you um, embarked on your your, your whole career, but w with this movie, it, it's it's uh, probably too long a story to tell. Yeah, but but um, let's let's sort of put ourselves in 1976, say, and um, I just arrived in Hollywood as a 25-year-old person trying to be a screenplay writer in the movie business, not knowing anyone, um, not having any money. Uh, and wondering how things work. And um, after writing f a few a dozen, let's say, screenplays, and um, uh, not having any luck finding anybody to take them on, um, I decided that I would either spend the rest of my life waiting next to a telephone, or I could choose something that would, um, if, if I could get it made, be so singular that it would compel attention. And, uh, and so because I didn't have any money and because my parents were uh, Flannery O'Connor's friends and exa literary executors, and because I knew I could get this novel, which I thought would fit the bill of giving them a jolt, so to speak, um, I, uh, I knew I could get it for nothing. Uh, it seemed like a wonderful thing to start with. And so eventually I found an agent who gave me the name and number and interceded on my behalf with an executive, a lady at Columbia Studios. And um, not knowing anything about anything, uh, I, off I went to Columbia and uh, where I was treated in the way that these people treat people like me, uh, which is that I said I wanted to make this movie and from this famous book, and, uh, and this lady condescendingly said to me that uh, this wouldn't be much of a problem if I found a director. And I said, oh, okay, a director, so who should I go to? And um, Steven Spielberg had just made Jaws at the time, and she said, well, you could get Steven Spielberg and surely the film would be made. So I said, okay. And uh, I ventured off and I found his address. <laughs> and I drove to Bel Air, California, and um, turned up at his house at 11 o'clock in the morning and knocked on the door. And a butler, this man was only a couple of years older than I was, a butler <laughs> opened the door, white gloves, and I said, I'm looking for Mr. Spielberg and I have something I'd like to talk to him about. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, Mrs. Spielberg is not here. And I said, OK, well, here's a screenplay, and here's a book, and here's my telephone number, and would you ask him to call me when he gets back? Well, a few hours went by, and all hell broke loose. I got these screaming calls from Columbia saying, how dare you, and how could you, and what do you, who do you think you are, and blah, blah, blah. And, and it was just completely horrifying, and I realized that I really didn't know anything, and that I'd better find somebody who knew something. And I had gone to boarding school in Ireland as a child, and I remember reading in the newspapers every day about a man called John Huston, who lived in Ireland, who was a legendary figure in American cinema. And so I said, ah, there's someone who knows something. Let me talk to him. And I found his number. <laughs> And I called him up in Mexico. And I said, Mr. Houston, you don't know who I am, because 
there's no reason for you to know who I am because I haven't done anything. But I have this thing which I think might interest you. And he said, send it down. So I packaged it up and sent it to Mexico. And a few days later, I got a call from him. And he said, this is very, very interesting. Come down to see me. So I got on the first plane to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And he met me at the airport. And I was a guest at his house for a week. At the end of which he said, um, I'm with you. And uh, I will be with you whenever you get this thing going. I will be there. And two years later, it took me two years to figure out a way of getting a few coppers together to do it. Uh, he was there when I needed him, and we made the movie. <laughs> well, it's like it's but it did, it did um, imprint in my mind that uh, the very best are always open. <coughs> Only the mediocre will shut you out. <laughs> I continue to believe that. And the last 40 years have given the character of the movie has proven my point. And that, and that in itself is, 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 a, is a beautiful, I don't know, lesson maybe for us because of one, you're a young man and you did not know anything, but you, which also probably had no filters to think, I can't just show up at Spielberg's house or just call John Houston. But you also had this desire, this, uh, a, a hope and a desire that gave you the ability to say, well, of course, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just call. I'm just going to do this. And your openness met the openness of John Houston, which is amazing, right? Here's a guy who's made all these films and he's so well known. He was open enough to listen to you and welcome you down, meet you at the airport. And when we think about these people that they're, they're, they're beyond, you know, where we can reach or there's, they're in the stratosphere somewhere. Um, so this helped you to uh, begin a whole career. You've done many films and documentaries. You're working on a film now. You're going to be going to Morocco tomorrow. This kind of openness that uh, you saw in John Houston, and what you also said is the openness that you have. But to do a film uh, like this, a, a story, and all of your films, um, can you tell us about what is it that interests you in a, a story to make into a film? What is it that is the connection that you're looking for? There's really only one thing. If I, I identify completely with the central character, then I, can expend the, then I can do it. I can expend the energy. I can do whatever is necessary. I can humble myself. I can submit myself to all manner of humiliation <laughs> and horror uh, in order to get it done. But if I can't identify completely, totally, with the central character, I don't have the energy to even try. And so, if there's anything that, that any of the, that the films that I do have in common, it is that I identify with each one of the protagonists of those films as though I were them. So tell us about you and Hazel. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Hazel Motes is, um, uh, I, I spent, let's say, between the age of, I don't know, 18 and 21, I, you know, went to school, went to university, and did uh, what I was doing and my coursework and everything. But what, what I really did was read Kierkegaard, uh, and to the exclusion virtually of everything else. And I was completely obsessed with this person and his way of looking at the world. And um, uh, so when I ran into, headlong, ran into Hazel Motes, I, I felt a great kinship with him. Uh, Hazel Motes is a man who is after the truth. And, but the truth is so disturbing that um, uh, he's essentially, he thinks he's after it, but he's really running away from it the entire time. 
And uh, his truth is that he is a Jesus hog. His truth is that he, this ragged figure uh, that haunts him, uh, this Christ figure that haunts him, is really his destiny. And it's a, it is the very last destiny he wants. And uh, so because he's not educated, because he's, he's a man, a creature of his place and time, the only thing he can think of doing is starting a church without Christ, um, where the blind don't see and the lame don't walk, and what's dead stays that way. This is his way of reacting to that which he's obsessed with, is by denying it. And, um, uh, and in the end, he, uh, having been wide, having had his eyes open, but having been, having been all the time blind to the truth, he has to, the only thing he can think of doing when he finds the truth is close his eyes, is blind himself in order to see. It's, it's very logical in the world that he inhabits. And I felt very closely akin to this. Um, I felt as though at that age I was, like Hazel Motes, a seeker after the truth. And, um, and that made me enamored of him as a character. Not that I was like him, but we had many things in common, I felt at the time. That was a long time ago. I don't know what else to say <laughs> you know, about, about him. I love him. Uh, I, I, I just think he's so funny. And so um, uh, there, I mean, I haven't seen this movie in 40 years, close to 40 years. And I remember, I think I could recite it. I think I could actually sort of recite it from first scene to the last. And I can certainly recite all his lines. I, 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 uh, and some of them come to me at different times of the day, wherever I might be in the world, you know. Um, uh, when he's meeting the landlady at the door, and she says, is it Protestant or is it something foreign? <laughs> it's church for sure. And he says, oh, no, man. Is Protestant. <laughs> so hilarious, you know. And when she tells him that he should have been one of their monks and should have lived in a monkery. <laughs> Just, I, to me, this is pure joy. What did your parents think? Of the movie or of. Um, um, well, I, my, my mother was, was uh, doing all the sets and costumes. Uh, so she was there, uh, you know, she participated in this whole nepotistic effort. Uh, there were essentially three families, all Irish Catholics, doing the movie. Uh, it was great. Mary McCarthy. Mary McCarthy? You mean the author? Yeah. Well, Who cares? There's a famous anecdote at your parents' house, isn't it? With Flannery gone? Uh, probably, but I've forgotten it. Tell me about it. It's about the Eucharist. Oh, about the Eucharist. Oh, yes. Well, there was a famous, uh, yes. D does anybody know this wonderful anecdote about Flannery O'Connor and the Eucharist? Um, the host, you know, the, the um, uh, and there was some discussion about it all being a symbol. And Flannery, um, I think, turned to whoever it was, perhaps to Mary McCarthy, and said, if I thought it was only a symbol, I'd say to hell with it. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so this, this, this uh, movie, as you were saying, your mother was involved. You and your brother are credited as the screenwriters. This was a big family affair. Um, it was an amazing endeavor. Uh, it was made on a very low budget, really. Um, but the, you have you have all these people involved from your family. So of course, his parents were so close to, to Flannery. Um, so you're asking, what do they think about this movie? So tell us about that, maybe it's really. Well, I, 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 uh, to, to my knowledge, they, 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 uh, they, they absolutely loved it. Um, and to my knowledge, they were, as I believe Flannery would have been, I was extremely keen to have an atheist make the movie. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, to me it seemed extraordinarily important. I mean, John was, uh, John, whom I came to love, I made another picture with him called Under the Volcano a couple of years later. Um, and he remained uh, a friend until the day he died. Um, he was uh, 
and absolutely a non-believer. And uh, to me, it was absolutely fundamental to make this. I mean, this is a, a story which is entirely about, like all of Flannery O'Connor's stories, about the action of grace, if you will, or what she would have thought of as grace um, on uh, the life and fate of a man. And um, he had, he, for, for him, all of this stuff was nonsense. And, um, and I was uh, determined to have someone who did not believe what Flannery believed, who didn't have the same world view uh, to make the film, because I thought, if I have someone who um, is going to turn into this religious mush, <laughs> which, I, which she would have abhorred, <laughs> and uh, I would have abhorred, you know, the sort of organ music and oh, the horror. <laughs> you know? And um, so, um, uh, so he came at it from an entirely humanistic side. And I thought, if, if the film doesn't pass muster in that way, it won't pass muster at all. And it did with him. So that was enough for me. Mm. And yeah, what, what did John Houston say? At the, you know, it, when it came to the conclusion of this movie... Uh, he said, Jesus wins it. He said this rather <laughs> bitterly. And I said, yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we just... Take some, yeah, if sure. anybody has any comments or anything to say, I would be delighted to hear. Yes. Well, I may be delighted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's an exceptional screenplay, and I was wondering what was your greatest difficulty in getting the actors to agree with the process? Uh, there was no difficulty at all. Um, I, I think the greatest, I had learned, I think early on in my life, that uh, I actually learned it from Houston, that um, uh, four versions of the Maltese Falcon had been made before his version. None of them had, were any good or had had any success. And when he went to, to adapt the, the novel, the Maltese Falcon, all he basically did was put the dialogue in the center and uh, you know, have a few little descriptions from the thing. But, but he didn't change it. He didn't try to improve it. And, um, it was my task not to try to improve on the original, because by trying to improve it, you're eventually going to screw it up. And that's what happens with so many adaptations. So, so it was really to be as faithful as possible to the text, because no dialogue, no one, no one who has ever written, at least I defy anyone to give me a name of someone who, had, except perhaps for Cormac McCarthy, uh, who, who was vastly influenced by her, whose ear for dialogue is as extraordinary as hers. And so what were we going to improve? So we, 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 we stuck to the extent that we possibly could in all available occasions to her text. Yes? <coughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. In the middle, and then over there, and then over there. Yeah. Now, yeah. What, what did you study such that you were able to walk in <laughs> a self-admitted unknowing person and structure the story for presentation on film. I have a degree in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, I don't think you have to study it. I don't think study has anything to do with anything in the end that has to do with uh, creation. I mean, I think you hone things in, but I think you have to listen. I think the capacity to, to uh, see what is in front of you is, uh, is probably uh, more helpful. Um, I, you know, I, I had an understanding of what Flannery was up to, and I, had, I was empathetic to what she was after. And so all I was trying to do as someone adapting it was to allow her to speak without me speaking in any way, is to withdraw myself and to put her forward. So that was the objective. I don't know to the extent that we succeeded. I mean, I think the only scene we wrote, if truth be told, is not, is not the best scene in the movie. Um, and it's the one we needed, a kind of a scene in which Enoch Emery, who is Flannery O'Connor's kind of very definition of the contemporary existentialist, essentially going from obsession to obsession, 
You know, he starts out with a mummy and he winds up as a monkey, which is what existentialists do. You know, they don't have any root, so they go from ism to ism, essentially, you know, in her way of looking at things. And so we were trying to describe what we were trying to sort of, we needed, because it's a movie as opposed to a work of literature, a kind of a sense of what his definition of wise blood would be. And so we wrote it, and I'm still deeply unhappy with it. Yes. So, I mean, you know, for this being your first film, producing and writing, I mean, I would think very daunting the fact that, like, you've got this personal family connection with the author that you're adapting your work. And then you hire, you know, this towering, legendary filmmaker like John Houston. So I guess, you know, were your visions in sync pretty much the entire time for the material? And also, like, what was the kind of greatest thing that you feel like you learned from your experience working with Houston on this film and your subsequent films on Volcano? Uh, how to tell a story on, on film. And, um, and to kill your darlings. <laughs> And that's, I think, that was my main lesson. Uh, I, I'm, I've become, I, I have been since then ruthless <laughs> um, about getting rid of stuff that I think is absolutely fabulous, but is in some way or another out of step with everything else that you're doing, and therefore damaging to the entire effort, or the holistic effort, if you will. And um, we, we cut out things from Wise Blood that, um, I, I, you know, that made me want to commit Harry Keary, <laughs> and at the time, but uh, on his requirement, and that I've subsequently learned were, um, were the right thing to do for the pace of the film, for the or organic nature of something, so that it becomes a whole, as opposed to, you know, lots of little pieces trying in harmonious stick together. I can give you a, a horde of examples, but take too long. Uh, yeah. My, my question was, um, in, in the beginning, when she sent the manuscript to Farrar Strauss, I remember from the habit of being, yes. the book your mother edited over letters, yes. they didn't get it. And, no. and so they were, you know, there was a problem, and she had a real fallout with them, and then went to Farrar, um, I'm sorry, Harper Brace, then she went to Farrar Strauss with it. Yes. My question for you is, as a screenwriter, how did you confront the anagogical aspects of the book that she was so strong about? How did you translate those in the writing of the script? Like, how did you, when you had to face the, the, the metaphysical dimension and the anagogical dimension that she wanted to come through in the novel, um, that would have scared the hell out of me personally. You know, how, how did you deal with that? I had an atheist directed. Contributed to it. I had an atheist directed on, on the absolute, I mean, and it was my absolutely firm belief, which has not changed, that um, that in itself would test whether all of those things would come through or not. And, um, and I believe they did, or they certainly do to me. And, uh, and they may not to people who, are, who, are, who refuse to see all of that or, or who don't quite grasp you know, as the people at HarperCollins in 19, whatever it was, 53. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that if people approach Flannery O'Connor and therefore approach this film from the vantage point of having to understand it before they can appreciate it, that uh, there's going to be some trouble. Uh, but that, I believe, is true of all fiction and all drama. Uh, understanding is not the issue. The issue is you allow it to to uh, permeate you. You you uh, you allow it to um, you, you approach it from love, if you will, as opposed to uh, an intellectual thing. And if you and if you can allow yourself to be engaged emotionally from it, eventually some kind of understanding, whatever it might be for you, will seep through. Uh, but if you're, I keep. I was saying to the father here that, that um, I, I, I occasionally have done this with, with, a, with any number of different films of mine, where I would go, go to an audience and say, okay, um, I'm going to explain everything to you, so that that particular uh, aspect of your reaction doesn't have to be engaged at all. You won't have to sit in an audience and try to appear intelligent when you ask me <laughs> questions at the end. Uh, because I've been through that 
exercise a million times where people are not even watching a film. They're just wondering what kind of interesting questions they can ask <laughs> at the end. And, um, uh, well, it's, it, it's human nature. Uh, I, I've done it myself. So, I mean, I know that that's true because I've felt that way a million times. And, and I try not to appear stupid. And, uh, and so my reaction to all of this is try to appear stupid <laughs> as opposed to that. And then you will be open enough for something interesting to happen, particularly with things that are challenging. Because one of the things that happens in life, in particularly in movies, is that there is less and less challenge. You know, the movies are made. I know, I was with a wonderful actor called Gael Garcia Bernal in Mexico a few days ago. And he was uh, regaling me with his horrible story about this Disney movie called Coco which is out now, which is about the Day of the Dead. The other was Cuertos. It's a very big deal in Mexico, the Day of the Dead. And he agreed to do the voice, uh, in both English and in Spanish. Now, every single line, every conceived image of this movie was tested with a hundred audiences. And the testing was perfected and perfected and perfected. So the entire thing is, in the end, this is a, the, 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 the result of corporate marketing in every conceivable detail to the point where in Spanish, this is a Mexican man. They would give him lines and he would say, but nobody in my country would ever dream of saying this. And they would say, we don't care. That's what you're going to say. say. This is how they would say it. No, 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 you're going to say it that way. Because that's what their marketing had told them to. Okay, so, well, there's a lot of that in the world now. And um, I have natural, uh, I rebel against this sort of thing. So uh, I think forget all of that and just engage and see what happens. Fall in love. Right away. Uh, and, and for a lot of us, who, I can say from my own experience of reading Flannery and Connery when I was in college um, and then seeing this movie, you are left with. I had no idea, no un, no way to to kind of understand these stories, but I was always fascinated by them and knew something was happening. You have, have spoken about this, and, and I think it's the um, you understand this as an artist, the producer of these films, of, of communicating is is not spoon feed us, you know, these things, but to put us in front of something. Can you talk about that? I I saw this quote about your father, and, and you've spoken about this, about what poetry should be, what art should be, is to lead us to uh, a mystery. I think you're referring to a comment that my father made, that a poem should be at least an elegance, and tends to be at most a revelation. That's what you're talking about. Well, uh, I, I don't know. For, take, for example, um, a scene which I... Um, now, mind you, I haven't seen this thing in half a lifetime, more than half a lifetime. <laughs> but uh, there's a scene in which uh, Hazel Motes drives out in his car, and he's stopped by the highway patrol, if you will, the policeman. And the policeman comes to his car and um, <laughs> doesn't like his face. I think that's, which is so charming. And, um, and gets him out of the car and kicks the car into a field, and the car winds up in a lake and all means of escape are gone. And uh, Hazel, there's nothing for the poor man to do. The poor man who has been, you know, for whom his car has been his way of escaping from himself, in a way, or from what he... Uh, and this, I've always thought of the policeman as an angel. I've always thought of that policeman as Hazel Motz's guardian angel. So what is the function of guardian angel? to hurt you, <laughs> basically, you know, into, uh, uh, into, you know, self-recollection. To hurt you into self-recollection would be the definition of what I would imagine a guardian angel to do. And uh, I've thought about that often in my life, and I've had plenty of guardian angels that have hurt me <laughs> into self-recollection. Um, so I find an endless supply of equivalencies in my life to the story of this man. Um, now, of course, you know, I'm 
a relatively well-educated person who moves in a certain world. It's hardly like Hazel Mutz's world, but in a way, it's exactly like it. Uh, I'm interested in beauty. I'm interested in truth. I'm interested in being what I am, and everything forces me away from it. I suspect this is true for everybody in the audience. So what does Flannery O'Connor do? She tells that same story, which belongs to all of us, but she tells it of a hick, you know, of a hillbilly um, who is Jesus-obsessed. We are obsessed by many other things, mostly our telephones, it seems. Um, but uh, someone is cackling. I love cackling. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I just find so many, I, I find all of this so incredibly relevant to my life. I know it doesn't seem that way because it seems so remote, but it isn't really for me anyway. I don't know, I'm sort of wandering off. But, um, when I, I, I don't generally talk about this movie. I've done so many movies between since then that um, this seems so far away, but then when I start talking about it, it becomes instantly uh, sits right next to me. So tell me, oh yeah, there's a question. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about the casting of the characters? Because Brad Dorf. Well, Brad Dorf had done a movie, a wonderful movie, called um, uh, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, mm -hmm. in which he played one Billy Babbitt, who was this, uh, this stuttering, young person who eventually is overwhelmed and kills himself. And I thought that performance was so stunning that, um, and so it was essentially between him and Tommy Lee Jones. Um, Tommy Lee Jones was then a young man, of course, and uh, he had been a, uh, he had done his thesis at Harvard on Flannery O'Connor. So he was extremely familiar with her work, and I've done quite a number of movies with him uh, in recent years. And what Tommy had was a natural ear for the deliverance of dialogue in the South. And I did a movie called The Three Burials of Melchiorres Estrada with him, a movie called The Homesman, more recently, and a film based on a James Lee Burke thriller called In the Electric Fist with Confederate Dead. And, um, and I have always loved his delivery of dialogue. Um, so he had that going for him, but there was something in there was something so strange about Brad, so kind of you know fanatical about his the look on his face that he was irresistible. Um, and the girl, um, the girl we couldn't find a Lily a Sabbath day Lily, and uh, when we were until we were three or four days away from shooting. And John was in Mexico getting ready to come to Atlanta, where we were going to shoot the film. And I was still getting uh, VHS tapes of aspiring people. And I got one from New York, and I happened to be with Milos Forman, the Czech director. And um, 